the Dallas Clinic, you hear the term conductivity all the time. Hey, what's the machine conductivity? Hey, did you get the conductivity? Hey, the conductivity is off. Like, oh my God, what is conductivity? I'm going to tell you. Today, I'm going to tell you what conductivity means, and it is going to be so easy. You are just going to feel relief. When I hear the term conductivity, I think about conduction, electrical activity. In terms of water, what makes water conductive is sodium. So conductivity with dialysis means sodium. Conductivity, sodium. Put them together. Now you're hearing something that is very familiar to you. We are very familiar with the word sodium. So when you hear conductivity, it is the amount of sodium that is in your dialysate. When it comes to sodium, there are two things that we know to be true. Number one, wherever sodium goes, water goes. And number two, a normal serum sodium level is 135 to 145 in a person. So those are two things that we already know about sodium and we can apply that to the dialysis machine to understand why conductivity matters. That's two things that we already know. I'm gonna talk about two more rules that we need to be familiar with to understand conductivity. Number one is diffusion. Diffusion simply is the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration with a semi-permeable membrane. And then osmosis is the movement of liquid across the semi-permeable membrane until concentrations are equal. I also have a great video on diffusion and osmosis. I'll put it up there, give it a click. So diffusion is the movement of molecules and osmosis is the movement of fluid. Okay, we know four things already. This is gonna be a breeze. Understanding these things will help you understand conductivity and why different patients have different conductivity settings and why we might use different conductivity settings on patients and the reasons why we would not use different conductivity settings on patients, okay? Conductivity, sodium. Now we're gonna go into a deep dive into my dialysis machine and we're gonna look at what conductivity looks like on a cellular level. Welcome to the inside of my dialysis machine and kind of the inside of my brain. Let me give you a tour. On the left, we have the dialysis patient. And then inside of the dialysis patient, we can see their bloodstream or another word for bloodstream, intravascular space. Then we have the dialyzer, the semi-permeable membrane. And on the far right, we have the dialysate. And what is dialysate again? It is a mixture of our purified water our acid, and our sodium bicarb. Let's talk about one of our rules right away. What is one thing that we know about ourselves is we know that a normal serum sodium level in a person is 135 to 140. So here I have the bloodstream and let's say we've got it at 140. And then we also have the dialysate set at 140. What does sodium mean again? Conductivity. So here, this is what the orders might look like. Machine conductivity, 140, and we know that our blood sodium level is 140. This is where another rule comes into play. Let's talk about diffusion. Molecules will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And what's going on here? Everything's already equal. So there's not going to be any movement of molecules across that semi-permeable membrane. And this is what dialysis looks like for them. We have the machine set, we set their goal, we clean their blood, remove their fluid, and there's no movement of sodium across the semi-permeable membrane. These people will tolerate dialysis very well. They don't have a lot of cramping. They rarely have low blood pressures. They don't have nausea or vomiting. If they come in short of breath, they leave feeling better, or maybe they don't have shortness of breath at all. And they also have little to no edema once they leave dialysis. So obviously they're very happy and they can go frolicking in the field. What about our people that don't tolerate dialysis very well? They come in, they're short of breath, they have a lot of swelling or edema in their legs. We set them up for dialysis, we try to get that fluid off, but they have intradialytic symptoms. They have nausea or vomiting, they have low blood pressures, they have cramping, and when they leave, they still have shortness of breath and edema. Even though they have the fluid on them for us to take, their body's going, no way, I'm keeping it, you can't have it, too bad. So then what do we do? What do we do with these patients? We talk to them about fluid restrictions. We need to limit their weight gains in between treatments. This is where the dietitian is key. They will come and talk to the patients about their food choices, their fluid intake, and really, they really do a great job of teaching our patients what types of food are good for them and what other types of food are going to make them feel short of breath and cause swelling. We might also increase their treatment time so we have a longer time frame to remove that fluid so they might tolerate it a little better, or they might come in for an extra treatment. So we do all those interventions. The patient is like, yep, I'm going to follow all of these restrictions. I'm going to try my hardest. I do not want to come in for an extra treatment. And they come in and the same thing happens. They have cramping, they have hypotension, and they leave short with shortness of breath and edema. 
And then what happens? Inevitably, the weekend comes and there's two days in between treatment and it's Sunday night and your dialysis patient cannot breathe and they cannot make it to Monday without dialysis. So they show up to the hospital for dialysis. They have a diagnosis of fluid overload. Our wonderful acute dialysis nurses will get them nice and dry and then they'll be discharged and come back to us at the clinic. And then, you know, we continue with the education and the interventions and we set them up for dialysis and then the cycle just keeps repeating itself. And this is, this is a beautiful cycle. Hospital stay, shortness of breath, dialysis, intradialytic symptoms, shortness of breath, hospital stay. It is just a cycle we're all too familiar with. Whatever we're doing is not working and we need to try other things. Sometimes a lot of facilities will just do more longer treatments or extra treatments. But what might happen for some of our patients are conductivity profiles. You're talking to your provider. You're like, oh, they have been hospitalized twice in the last 60 days. I, I don't know what else to do. The patient won't come in for an extra treatment. Maybe they'll increase their treatment time, but we still, we need to do something. And the provider might be like, let's try a conductivity profile. Let's see if that kind of helps things. And this is what the order might look like in, in your EMR. Cool. What? What? What does this mean, 150 to 135 at 50% progressive? What does this mean? Oh, of course, I've got a visual for you guys. This is what it looks like. This might be even what your screen looks like. So at the start of dialysis, we are going to set the conductivity, the sodium at 150. And at the end of dialysis, we're going to progressively decrease the conductivity to 135. Stagger it down. Progressive profile of sodium. So now, what does this look like on the dialysis machine? We flood the dialysate with sodium, and we know our bloodstream has a conductivity of 140. So here we got, we're going 150 to 140. So we know that this is not equal, and this is where we're like, oh, I know what's going to happen here. Lindsay's been talking about it for the last hour. Diffusion. Molecules are going to move from, air, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. So all of the sodium is going to move across the dialyzer into the bloodstream and make our serum sodium go up to 150. So now it's equal. That's awesome. Everybody's happy in science, except for the body's like, whoa, where did all this sodium go come from? This is way too much. I need to dilute this, right? Because what's one of the rules? Wherever sodium goes, water goes. So now the body's like, oh my God, I have to let go of this fluid because my serum sodium is way too high. This needs to be diluted ASAP. Water is going to move from our, if we have edema, the fluid's going to move from our extravascular space to our intravascular space. So from the fluid that is making a shorter breath or the fluid in their legs causing edema, that is going to start moving into the bloodstream. And I am just think this is the coolest thing. Here we go. We have the water moving across into the intravascular space. And the other thing that this does is when we increase intravascular space, we're also increasing their blood pressure. So our people that have a lot of hypotension during dialysis, this is going to help keep their blood pressure up. It'll help prevent low blood pressures during dialysis too, which will allow us to remove fluid. Now we're getting to the end of dialysis and we have a conductivity or a sodium level in our dialysate of 135 because we don't want patients to leave the dialysis clinic with a serum sodium of 150 that's way too high i mean they came in with a normal serum sodium i mean they should leave with one i, I think i think that's only fair so this is what it looks like now so now that dialysis is over or nearing the end we're going to correct it so now we're going to lower the dialysate here and with the roll of diffusion Molecules are going to move from an area of high concentration to low concentration across the semi-permeable membrane, across the dialyzers. Let's roll that footage. There, it's moving. Super cool. There, and that's the end of dialysis. Our conductivity profiles seem magical and awesome. Like, why wouldn't we use these conductivity profiles for everybody? I have one reason that's not up there. I think that this, the movement of all these molecules across the semi-permeable membrane into the bloodstream and out of the bloodstream, that can cause more fatigue with our dialysis patients. It's more work on the body. So I think that's one of the reasons why if they're already tolerating dialysis, well, you don't need to change things up. You can just keep it the way it is. But what about our people that come in with a high blood pressure or low sodium levels? These are two people that conductivity profiles are not right for. And let's see why low sodium. So if they already have low serum sodium and we flood the dialysate with a lot of sodium, 
we're going to have a high influx of sodium into our intravascular state, into our bloodstream. And what happens when we overcorrect hyponatremia too quickly? Yeah, we have neurological symptoms. We have seizures, blurred vision, headache. That would be super bad. So we don't want to do that. We do not want to overcorrect. So our people with low serum sodium levels and high fluid gains, these people really the only intervention we can do besides discussion of fluid restrictions is to have a long treatment to safely correct those low sodium levels. Another visual. Love it. All right, now we have high blood pressure. Early in the video, I talked about how this high serum sodium level is going to help pull fluid to the intravascular space and it's going to help raise the blood pressure. But what about our patients that already come in with high blood pressure? Their blood pressure is high. Their alarms are ringing the whole treatment. We're talking to the physicians. We're trying to manage their meds. Every day they come in with a high blood pressure and even with their high blood pressure, they still have cramping. With their high blood pressure, they still have shortness of breath and edema. So these people who are already have a high blood pressure, we don't want to raise it anymore. And that is everything that I know and love about conductivity profiles. They're not for everybody, but for the right person, they can help a lot. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. It's a song about Diana. Thank you.